What do a, a young woman in a Japanese city and an elderly man in an Indian village have in common? At first glance, it looks like almost nothing. Navigating a busy city in Japan is completely different than navigating an Indian village, but Google Maps has to work for both of these people. And the things that they want to share are completely different too, but Facebook has to work for both of these people as well. Now, when I look back on the time that we spent trying to solve these problems, the thing that really stands out to me is how similar these problems actually ended up being. So let's uh, rewind back to 2005, and this is how Google Maps looked when it first launched. You might notice a couple of things missing here, but um, <laughs> it's come a long way since then. Today, Google Maps um, gives you directions almost anywhere you go in the world. And as we started to expand to more and more countries, though, things started to get a bit more complex. I remember the first time we went to India, and everyone was saying, we're not like the rest of the world. We're different here. And they, are, they had a point. This is a photo that I took when I was there, and you can see that you get stuck in some pretty interesting traffic jams. This is a pedestrian footbridge, believe it or not. But the maps are different, too. You might notice something missing from this map. There are no street names. This isn't Google doing a bad job of labeling the map. In India, many of the streets actually don't have names. And it's even rarer to have an address with a number. So this means that in India, Google Maps was giving directions something like this. Continue on unnamed road. Turn left on unnamed road. Your destination is at unnamed road. Not great, right? Japan, on the other hand, Japan has some of the most um, detailed data of anywhere in the world. But when we went to Japan, people were also saying, hey, Japan's not like the rest of the world. We're different here. And they had a point as well. I mean, I remember being blown away by like, the sheer volume of people everywhere, but also how well-ordered everything is. And the maps look different too. You can see there's all kinds of things on this map. But the one thing they don't have are street names. But here in Japan, it's for a different reason. Addresses aren't described as streets. They're described as blocks, the spaces between the streets. This means that an address can actually end up looking a bit like a phone number. So although Japan has this incredibly precise address system, you ended up having things like District 1, Block 23, Building 5, Apartment 228. So Google Maps was giving directions something like this. Continue on unnamed road. Turn left on unnamed road. Your destination is at 1235228. Also not great, right? Actually, it wasn't just India and Japan. In every place we went to in the world, people were saying, we're not like the rest of the world. We're different here. Everywhere was different, and everywhere had unique needs. How can you build directions that work just as well for Japanese cities as they do for Indian villages? That was the problem that the Google Maps team were facing. The Facebook sharing team had a problem, too. This is how Facebook looked when it launched back in 2004, back when it was still the Facebook. And this was just um, for a small community to connect and share. But it's come a long way since then. Now Facebook connects over a quarter of the world's population. Now, the Facebook sharing team's job is to give all these different people, give them the tools to share. And this is really difficult, because everybody wants to share something different. There's almost an infinite number of things that people might want to share. And so this is, this is so difficult. How are we going to go about doing this? Maybe the way to do it is to start taking these people and dividing them into groups so that we can understand them better. So you might start looking at things like, what country are they in? Are they in? urban or a rural area? What's their age? What's their gender? Maybe look at their education. Maybe we should look if they're using mobile or desktop. Maybe we should look at their usage patterns. Do they use, do they use Facebook a lot? Do they use it little? Maybe we want to look at the kinds of things that they want to share. Are they sharing text? Are they sharing video? Are they sharing photos? This list is endless. It goes on and on. And when you start multiplying all these factors together, it becomes unfeasible. How can you build sharing tools that work just as well for a young woman in Japan as they do for an elderly man in India? And that was the problem that the Facebook sharing team were facing. 
Now, the, the scale of these problems that the Google and the Facebook teams had to solve had become so large that it had become unfeasible to try and solve them. But the breakthrough came when we stopped thinking about all the ways in which people were different and started focusing on the ways in which everyone's the same. So if you ask for directions in India today, people won't give you an address or a street name or any of this stuff. They'll say things like, it's by the temple, or go past the river, or it's next to the school. They use landmarks to help you get around. And the map reflects this. There may be no street names on this map, but you can see that there's lots of landmarks here that the local people use to get around. Now, in Japan, the situation is actually similar. Because of that really complex address system we talked about, people use landmarks instead of street names to get around. And again, you can see this on the map. No street names, loads and loads of local landmarks here. Now, it turns out that it doesn't matter where you go in the world, from Tokyo to Bangalore to Glasgow, if you ask someone on the street how to get around, they'll describe how to do it using landmarks as well as street names. And suddenly you realize, if you look outside this building here, everything's a landmark. The restaurant in the bottom right is a landmark. The train station is a landmark. The big buildings are landmarks. The river is a landmark. And the street names, they're just another type of landmark. It turns out that Google Maps had been using landmarks for directions all along. It's just they'd only been using one specific type of landmark. So with this insight, the Maps team went about upgrading the directions to use all the different types of landmarks that are available, sometimes using street names when they're relevant, other times using something else. So now in India, when you ask for directions, Google Maps gives you something like this. Continue past KMK Complex. Turn left at Goda Temple. Your destination is on the left opposite the big banyan tree. <laughs> That's a great landmark, right? So by focusing on the ways that people were similar, instead of focusing on the ways in which people were different, the Google Maps team were able to help people get around no matter where they are in the world. It turns out that people navigate the Japanese city and the Indian village in pretty similar ways. But what about this Facebook sharing problem? I mean, how are we possibly going to build tools to support all of these different things that these people all around the world want to share? This seems incredibly difficult. Um, now, the funny thing is, you might be thinking, like, you know, why do we need to help people share some more? I'm sure, you know, I've got some friends that have no problem sharing stuff on Facebook at all. I'm sure you've got some of the same. But I've also got some friends that barely share anything. And I know that me and the rest of their friends would love to see the more meaningful um, elements happening in their lives. And so the breakthrough here happened when we stopped thinking about what people want to share and started thinking, why aren't they sharing it already? It turns out that the biggest barriers that prevent people from sharing are not to do with the technology or the tools at all. They're psychological barriers. And so instead of trying to solve for all of the different things that people want to share, the Facebook team decided to try and solve those psychological barriers that were universal amongst everyone. So this is a photo of my, t my son that I took at breakfast. He's looking pretty happy here at the moment, but little does he know that he's going to try haggis for the first time this evening. <laughs> um, now, I always think he looks adorable, but to be honest, this isn't the best photo I've ever taken. It's a bit grainy, the lighting's not great, composition's not fantastic. This is definitely not good enough that I would be willing to share this on Facebook. And this is a shame, because I know that his grandparents always love to see photos of him. So I've drawn a pretty technical diagram here, so follow along. <laughs> this is the range of quality that something can be from bad all the way up to awesome. And right here in the middle, there's a bar. This is the quality bar. This is how good something needs to be for me to be willing to share it. Now, you can see here that this picture of my son is underneath the quality bar. This is the psychological barrier that's preventing me from sharing it. So if I want to share this uh, picture, there's two things that we could do. Number one is we can elevate the, qu the quality of my content to over the bar. The other thing that we could do is to lower that psychological quality bar. Now, if you're smart, you'll probably do both of these things. And that's exactly what the Facebook team did. And you can see this theme in some of the most recent launches that they've done. So using the Facebook camera, I can use the augmented reality masks to turn my son into a cute little raccoon. Or if I want to be a bit more classy, I can also um, turn him into a, a kind of classy pencil sketch. These things elevate the quality of my content. 
and make me more proud to share it. I'm actually quite keen to share that raccoon picture now. I think it's cool. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, the Facebook Live camera lets you stream live video from your mobile phone. Now, I'm thinking about um, making it up to him by um, live streaming his uh, reaction to trying shortbread for the first time tomorrow. Live, live video is candid and it's raw. Um, you can't edit it. Uh, you, you don't rehearse it. The quality tends to be lower. And so this lowers that psychological quality barrier. Because if you and your friends are all sharing this stuff that's candid, you'll be more likely to do so yourself. So it turns out that the psychological barriers that were preventing that young woman in Japan and the elderly man in India are the same. By focusing on the, ways, the things that people had in common, again, rather than their differences, Facebook is able to help people connect and share all around the world. So now if we look back again, we realize that this young woman in the Japanese city and the elderly man in the Indian village have a lot more in common than it first seems. It's really easy to focus on the differences between people. But if we want to build great tools that make life better for billions of people all around the world, we need to start focusing on how similar we all are as human beings. And it seems to me there's never been a better time to start. Thank you very much.